Okay, starting with Sophocles. Um, if you read the introduction, <coughs> excuse me, to his book, or to the uh, edition by Robert Fagels, you'll see that Sophocles was born sometime around 496, and then he dies sometime around 406 BC. So his life pretty much spans the entire fifth century BC. Um, you can read there about, you know, some of the uh, civic positions he held, etc. The awards he won for his plays. He wrote over 120 plays, seven of which survive um, in totality. Better lighting. Um, three of those obviously being the three Theban plays or the three Oedipus plays, if you want to call them um, that. But I want to begin talking a little bit about the introduction. I'm not going to talk a lot about the introduction other than to point out one thing that it omits. And that's this notion of glory. Um, if I remember correctly, Knox doesn't mention the word glory at all in terms of a motivating factor for why um, in the play Antigone, for why Antigone does what she does. And yet Antigone frequently mentions glory. And it seems to me that when you have a character mention something as being a motive, uh, we have to take that into account. We have to look at that as, you know, possibly being not just a secondary motive, but a primary motive as to why she does what she does. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, really um, say much else about the introduction uh, or say much about the introduction. I do want you to read the introduction to the book and the introduction to the plays carefully. One other thing, and, and he does touch on this, but, but he touches on it in, in different language than I'm going to use. The play presents a dilemma and the dilemma ultimately is what does a person follow when his or her personal beliefs are in contrast in opposition to um, the law of the land, the state laws. I mean, the, the, the play Antigone seems pretty much to emphasize that conundrum. What do you follow? Do you follow your conscience? Do you obey the laws? If the laws directly contradict what your conscience tells you to do, throw your conscience to the wind and obey the laws or throw the laws to the wind, obey your conscience and pay the consequences. Uh, it's pretty clear what Antigone decides to do. I mean, she obeys her conscience and dies as a result of that. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty important theme that is in this play. It's also to a lesser extent in Oedipus the King, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, and, and very briefly, the very last sentence of the introduction, um, Knox writes, in the somber world of the play, this is on page 53, in the somber world of the play, against the background of so many sudden deaths and the dark mystery of the divine dispensation her courage and steadfastness are a gleam of light. She is the embodiment of the only consolation tragedy can offer. So notice what, what Knox is suggesting here. This is, this is the only consolation. This is the only alleviation of pain and suffering that tragedy offers us, the readers. That in certain heroic natures, unmerited suffering unmerited, unearned, undeserved, unfair suffering and death 
can be met with the greatness of soul, which, because it is purely human, brings honor to us all. And what he seems to be meaning by that is we are ennobled by Antigone's suffering by which produces greatness of soul. We, meaning all humanity, is somehow improved by that. Um, so a question I want you to consider is, is that true? Applying it to both this play and Oedipus the King. Um, and if it is true, how is it true? How, how does it bring honor to us? Here, here's an example. But, or, or let me ask this question. Does it only bring honor to us if we are aware of it? If, if we read the play, understand the play, interpret the play? Or does it bring honor to all of us, regardless whether or not we are aware of the play? Um, trying to think how to put this delicately. I would challenge you to turn on the news and look at what is going on around the United States. Um, and tell me how this play brings honor to somebody walking up to two deputies sitting in their patrol car and shooting them without cause, without any reason, without, without those deputies having done anything to them. And don't go, you know, Black Lives Matter, all cops are bastards, blah, blah. That's, those are just slogans. Those mean nothing, okay? I mean, how does what Knox is saying apply to that individual or to people setting fires or looting businesses or destroying businesses or rapists, murderers, pillar, pick your crime, so to speak, right? It's just a question. Um, I'm gonna start with Antigone. I'm gonna discuss Antigone first. I, I think I said in the email, I've never done this before. Whenever I've taught these plays, I've always taught Oedipus the King first and then Antigone, because chronologically within, within the plots of the plays, that's, that's how they should go. It should go Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and then um, Antigone. Because we hear in Antigone about Oedipus's death. Well, Oedipus dies in Oedipus at Colonus, even though that's, that's the chronological order within the worlds of the plays. Chronicle, the, the order in which Sophocles wrote the plays is Antigone, Oedipus the King, and then Oedipus at Colonus. Um, so I've, I've never kind of conceptually dealt with the plays in their order of composition. And I want you to try to kind of do that, at least by the lectures. Even You may have already read Oedipus the King first, since that's what I had originally asked you to do. Um, To try to, to try to understand the plays in the order in which they were written, in the order in which they were first performed, the order in which people of Athens would have experienced them, um, I think is valuable because it gives us a better insight into how they might have experienced them. And it, it, it colors our understanding, just as if we were to read Oedipus the King first and then Antigone, that colors our understanding of Antigone. So, so this is gonna be new for me. Um, so my lecture slash discussion of the play might be a little bit disjointed, okay? Before we um, actually look at the play, I wanna share a couple of things, uh, put them on the screen for you. And the first thing is the background that's behind me. Um, this is called the theater of, I think it is Epidauros, uh, ancient Greek theater, obviously. This one was constructed 
I think it was in the fourth century. This holds somewhere between, or would have held somewhere between 13 and 15,000, okay, at the time of its construction, etc. So you see, you know, all the seats rising up and there's, you know, staircases in between the rows and such. The big round area here, this is called the orchestra. This is where the chorus does its part. That is, it walks from one side to the other. And then either the entire chorus walks back the other way. So you have the strophe and antistrophe, or part of it walks across and the other part walks across the other direction. Back here is where the actual stage would have been. And behind that, the what's called the skene, S-K-E-N-E, which is the house that serves both as, you know, usually there's a palace or building that characters come in and out of. It serves as that, but it also serves as the dressing room so that actors can um, go back into there, be hidden from side of the audience, change their costuming, put on a new mask, a different mask so that they can play different characters, come back out, um, etc. cetera, okay? So that's one, and the other one is, this theater, and <clears throat> this is the ancient theater of, of Athens itself, right? Um, this is, if you remember the end of the Eumenides, um, and we hear the discussion of, you know, after the, the Furies are transformed, apotheosized into the Eumenides, and everybody is fat, dumb, and happy at the end of the play, and everybody leaves. They, they leave from, here's the stage, here's the skinny, okay? Um, here's the orchestra where the chorus does its bit. So what do they do? We were told that they leave and they walk up and out. That probably means, you know, the actors start from here and they walk up and they come up like these steps. And as they go, the people, the the playgoers, what are called the theatron, those are the viewers, that's what the word theater means to view, okay? So this is the seating here is called the theatron, T-H-E-A-T-R-O-N. The people would then rise up following behind them and they go off, and this is all part of the Acropolis, and on the top of the Acropolis is the Parthenon. So they would, you know, walk up and leave, right? So just a couple of examples of what an ancient, um, Greek theater would look like. Both of these two that I, that I just showed, and there's, I, I think there's something like half dozen more still in existence. Um, they have regularly, they regularly put on productions during the summer months. So you can go to these and see plays perform, okay? So let's start with <clears throat> Antigone, all right? And bear in mind, as with, <coughs> as with the story in the Oresteia, the story about Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, and Aegisthus, Orestes and Electra, etc., cetera, um, the stories about Oedipus and his family were all ancient. They were, they were well, well known to an Athenian audience of the fifth century. I mean, they, they would be like, um, you know, stories of George Washington and Abe Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, well-educated Americans. Let me, let me put it that way, you know, because we've got a lot of people who know nothing about history. Um, they would know. Your, your average Athenian was well-versed in the mythology of, ancient Greece, and this figures into the mythology. If you turn to the back of, of your book for a moment, you have, find it, I just have it. You have 
Um, there's, there's a, there is a genealogy and it's the genealogy of Oedipus and his family. Oh, literally just had it. It's, uh, it comes after the select bibliography. Well, Oedipus ultimately traces his line back to the gods, Ares and Aphrodite, right? So that means Eteocles, Polynices, Ismene, and Antigone also therefore trace their, this, that's why I said this is part of kind of the national mythology. It, it would, children would learn these stories, you know, in the nursery, so to speak, okay? So pick up with the beginning of Antigone. And we're giving the setting. It's the Royal House of Thebes. It's night. The invading armies of Argos have just been driven from the city. And we're going we're gonna to hear Ismene say that, essentially, in her opening speech, okay, um, fighting on opposite sides, the sons of Oedipus, Ateocles, and Polynices have killed each other in combat. Their uncle, Creon, is now king of Thebes. Okay? So Antigone enters, so, so let me back up for just a moment. And this is one of the reasons why I usually begin with Oedipus the king, because it, it helps make some things a little bit clear. No, let me rephrase that. It helps make some things a little bit clear to a modern audience who is not familiar with this mythology. Um, Oedipus is the son of Laius, L-A-I-U-S, and Yocasta, J-O-C-A-S-T-A, -A. okay? Uh, long story short, Oedipus kills his father, marries his mother, doesn't know that she is his mother, and has children by her. So the children that he has by her are also his own siblings, his half-siblings, right? So, uh, Antigone and Ismene, while the daughters of Oedipus, they are also the half-sisters of Oedipus, okay? Creon is Yocasta's brother. So he is a blood relative because they are the daughters of Yocasta. Um, but when Eteocles and Polynices kill each other in their battle for Thebes, the, the, the only <clears throat> surviving relative, male relative, let me put it that way, is Creon. So he takes control. He takes authority of, of the city of Thebes, okay? So Antigone opens the play. She comes in, and as many comes in, you know, slowly after her, and Look at what she says. I'm going to begin with the third line. Do you know one, I ask you, one grief that Zeus will not perfect for the two of us while we still live and breathe? Okay. She says one pain. Do you know of one pain that Zeus will not perfect? Well, what does she mean by perfect? She means to make complete, to fulfill to bring to total fruition, to, you know, if it's a bottle, to top off the very top of that bottle of pain. So what she's saying, our lives are full of pain and they're just going to get worse. She goes on, there's nothing, no pain. Our lives are pain. No private shame, no public disgrace, nothing I haven't seen in your griefs and mine. In other words, everything about our, about our lives is public and our lives totally subsist of pain, okay? So she asked her sister, have you heard about what the commander has decreed? Line 12, 
the doom reserve, reserved for enemies marches on the ones we love the most. The doom reserved for enemies. Well, what is that? The judgment put on enemies. Well, your introduction talks about this. It, it was common in ancient Athens to let your enemies rot in public. In fact, in fact that wasn't only common in ancient Athens. That notion, oh, that goes all the way up, you know, in England, geez, to definitely at least the middle of the 17th century. Uh, it goes up even later than that in the United States, if you think of public hangings and, stuff and such. But, I, but in, you know, in terms of what was done in England, you know, you would take people who were hung at gallows, who were drawn and quartered and stuff, let's take people that were hung, and you would hang their bodies from London Bridge, or you'd put their heads on pikes, so that as people would, would traverse London Bridge to go from the city of London to the district of Southwark on the south side of the Thames, um, they would walk past or ride past these heads on pikes you know, spears, essentially. Uh, you'd hang bodies until they fall apart, until the birds ate the flesh and the sinews, the ligaments and tendons that united bones to bones and bones to muscles rotted away and the bones just, you know, fell into the river and such. Um, well, one of the reasons you did that in ancient Greece was if you didn't bury the body, then the soul would not be a rest. So if you really want to get back at your enemies, don't bury them, right? So as many says, no, I haven't heard. And then she says, line 19, she talks about not since the armies of Argos vanished just this very night. So that implication, because it's still nighttime, that implication is it's only been a couple of hours, maybe a few hours since the armies of Argos, you know, the, the armies of, you know, the town of Agamemnon, okay, um, since they left Thebes. She said, I, I don't know anything else. So Antigone explains, that's why I brought you here. As many as, what's, what's up, what's going on, right? Page 60. Antigone says, right about in the middle of the page, beginning run line 29, Creon has laid him, Eteocles, eldest brother, Creon has laid him in the earth, and he goes with glory down among the dead. He goes with glory down among the dead. Why? Because he's been buried with military honors. Modern, you know, American parlance, that would mean he was buried at Arlington National Cemetery and he had a full 21 gun salute. And, you know, I don't know, maybe you could even say the president presided over the internment ceremony. Okay. That's kind of what's being implied here. She says, going on, but the body of Polynices, second eldest, who died miserably, why citywide proclamation rumor has it forbids anyone to bury him even mourn him. So there's a citywide decree, city there meaning statewide. The polis here is the city state. If you read the introduction, overall introduction to the book, it talks about, you know, because of the geography and topography of Greece, you know, you get these little, almost like hamlets, these, these little pockets. And those become self-contained political units. So Argos is one, Thebes is one, Athens is one, Sparta is one, Pelos is one, you know, etc. So nobody can bury him. In fact, you can't even mourn him. That means you can't even cry for him. Okay? He's to be left unwept, unburied, a lovely treasure for birds and such. She continues, such I hear is the martial law, a good crayon lays down for you and me, yes, me, I tell you. Now, when she says our good crayon, she's probably, probably, I think, I could be wrong, she's being sarcastic. 
she doesn't mean that he's good. She means, in, in, uh, in fact, the exact opposite. And she says, he's laid down this martial law for you and for me. Notice, even though it's a citywide proclamation, she's drawing it particularly to them. Why? Well, if you read the introduction, whose custom was it generally? Whose job was it generally? As it still is in many cultures to prepare the dead for burial and such. The women's, the women family members in, in particular. So that's why she's saying, he's done this to us. So she says, all right, now you know what's going on. And now you will show whether or not you were worth your breeding, worth your royal blood. And as many as like, what do you mean? And she asks, line 52, what do you mean, 51? And Antigone says, will you lift up his body with these bare hands and lower it with me? No. She kind of means metaphorically there, will you lift up the body off the ground and put it in a grave? But she doesn't mean that literally. Literally, all she means is, will you help me pick up some handfuls of dirt and scatter it on the body? Because burial did not have to mean total six feet in the ground burial. It could be merely a scattering of dust with the requisite prayers to the gods of the underworld. Okay? Look at Ismini's reply. You bury him when a law forbids the city? See, that right there, I think at least, gets at the crux of that crux of the matter. The law forbids it, and you would do it? On, on Why would you do this? He is my brother, and your brother too. No one will ever convict me for a traitor. Now, notice what Antigone is suggesting there. If this ever goes to trial, no one's going to find me guilty. She just, you know, okay, so there's a city law. Fine, I'll bury him. Let Crayon try me. Let him go to a court of law and try. no one will find me guilty. Why? Because every one of those jurors in a court of law will also be someone who at some point in their lives will have a family member die. And it will be incumbent upon them to do what she's later going to say is the laws of the gods require, to do what the laws of the gods require. As Manny says, yeah, but I mean, Crayon, he has expressly Antigone, no. Bottom of page 61. He has no right to keep me from my own. That is, he has no right, he has no legal authority to stop me from doing this. As Manny gives a fairly long speech and says, come on, Think of our father. Think of the crimes he did. And then she says, line 70, now look at the two of us left so alone. Think what a death we'll die. The worst of all, that is, we'll suffer the worst of all deaths if we violate the laws and override the fixed decree of the throne, its power. You're just stubbing your nose at Crayon. We must be sensible. In other words, you know, it's okay to have a conscience, Antigone, but, you know, when the law requires you to do something, you do what the law requires. But then she adds this. And this is, this is another, I think, major theme of the play. And it's, it's interesting that Sophocles throws this in. Remember, we are women. We are not born to contend with men. Now, this play is first performed sometime around 441, 442 BC. Women still did not have rights in Athens. They did have some rights in Sparta, right? But Sophocles is, is not Spartan. He's, he's not a, a lover of Sparta. He is a lover and defender of Athens. He fought at, you know, various battles. Um, he celebrated you know, Athenian victory over the Persians at the Battle of Salamis when he was 15 years old. 
This was back in 481 BC. Um, and here he is raising this issue of, you know, can women essentially challenge the wills of men? Remember, we are women. We are not born to contend with men. But then she says also we're underlings, like servants, ruled by much stronger hands. So we must submit in this end, things still worse. And I don't know that this, this is the case, but I think the thing's still worse. She's talking about sex. We have to submit in that, even if we don't want to. She's not talking about to crayon. She's talking about to men, right? She says, for me, here's what I'll do. I'll beg the dead to forgive me. That is, when I die, I'll go down and I'll say, sorry, but you know, I had to obey the laws. I'm forced, I have no choice. I must obey the ones who stand in power. Now, if you go back for a moment to the Eumenides, um, Athena asked the Furies, did Orestes act of his own free will? They say he did. What does Orestes say? Nope. Apollo made me do it. Apollo told me to do this. What does Apollo say? Zeus told me to tell him. Notice how the buck keeps getting passed. Okay? Zeus told me to do this. So finally it comes to Zeus is the one ultimately responsible. And Athena kind of says, therefore you're innocent. Okay? He's innocent because he was compelled. Yes, he did it. He admits, I did this. But he was compelled to do it. She says, I'm forced. That is, I'm compelled. I have no choice. I must obey the ones who stand in power. Antigone says, fine, have it your way. Line 86. 85, I will bury him myself. And even if I die in the act, that death, what? Will be a glory. So she's equating right here. Her fulfilling this duty to her brother and this duty to the gods, also with personal glory. She is going to receive glory because of this. I will lie with the one I love and loved by him. Lie meaning in death. She's not going to, you know, this isn't necrophilia or anything weird. I have longer to please the dead than please the living here. True, right? Because when you die, how long are you dead? Forever. In the Greek system of thought, forever. You never come back. Okay? How long are you alive? You know, if you take the biblical psalmist account, you know, three score and ten, eh, if you're lucky, maybe four score, 80 years. Sophocles lived 90 years. Okay? Uh, today, there are very few people that go past 110. There are some that live that long. I think last summer, somebody died who was 117. But generally, 80s to 90s, that's the ballpark figure. So 80 or 90 years here on Earth to suffer Hamlet slings and arrows of outrageous fortune versus the rest of eternity with the dead in Hades. That's why she says, I have longer to please the dead than please the living here. In the kingdom down below, I'll lie forever. Do as you like. Dishonor the laws the gods hold in honor. So, oh, no, no, go ahead. Do what you want. Please crayon. But in doing so, she is saying, you will be dishonoring the gods. Why? Because you dishonor the laws that they hold in honor. It's me. Well, I, 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 I do them no dishonor. The I'd 
that's I apostrophe would. I would do them that in the would there means I desire. I desire to do them no dis, I don't want to dishonor the gods, but I mean, come on, defy the city? Break the government's law, break the federal law, right? So right there, right there in a nutshell, dishonor the gods or dishonor the city. Defy the gods or defy the city. That's the choice. That's, that's the dilemma. That's the central tragedy if you want, of the play. How do you decide which to do? Or what do you decide which to do, okay? She says, I have no strength for that. For which? To find the city? Yes. Because she says, I'd do them no dishonor. I would do them no dishonor. The would there that I described as, you know, which means desire or wish, it's, the subjunctive mood. See, normally when we speak and talk, we speak in what's called the indicative mood. That's, we're indicating things as they really are, right? The subjunctive mood indicates a condition contrary to fact. Well, what's the, what's the fact that she is in contrary to? She's not gonna defy the city. So she is going to dishonor the gods, even though she doesn't want to. She doesn't necessarily intend to. Antigone, go ahead, go ahead. I'm going to bury my brother. Is Manny. Just keep it a secret. Don't tell anybody. She's like, are you kidding? She says, shout it from the root. She wants everybody to know. Why? Page 64 at the bottom. She says, line 110, 11, 112. I will suffer nothing as great as death without glory. Well, let's put that in a positive because it's, it's made negative because of the nothing. I will suffer a great death with glory. See, that's the positive turn of that sentence. She said, I will suffer nothing as great as death without glory. That is, death without glory is the greatest suffering one can endure, right? Go to the top of the next page. Very first word by the chorus glory and it then goes on and talks about glory the glory of the sun the glory of various things and then the chorus says line 140 zeus hates with a vengeance all bravado the mighty boasts of men is that men generically or men um genderedly if you want is that humanity or is it the male aspect of humanity i think it's humanity zeus hates with the vengeance all bravado the mighty boasts well what's his mate what's antigone been doing she's been boasting so is that telling us that that's what zeus hates or is of course referring to Crayon's bravado of passing a law, making an edict that goes against the laws of the gods. Okay. Um, they go on, they talk about the fighters against Thebes, Polynices, Eteocles. Eteocles was defending Thebes, he was the king of Thebes. Polynices, the younger brother, had left Thebes and then attacked Thebes with seven famous captains, generals if you want. Um, there's a famous play, Seven Against Thebes. Um, and they were defeated, okay? So they go on, they talk about how, you know, their high hopes crashed against the walls, et cetera, et cetera. But now there's victory line 165, um, one, line 171 and following. They kind of invoke the god Dionysius, why? All of these plays are written for the Dionysian rebels, for, for the Dionysian festivals. It's, it's interesting, ancient Greek drama has its origins in the religious festivals of ancient Greece, 
and you know the drama develops it keeps going on and then with the sack of rome beginning around 410 a.d drama dies there's no drama at all anywhere in the quote-unquote civilized world from roughly 410 450 a.d until the late ninth or 10th centuries AD, so 900 to 1000 AD um, in Western Europe. And it begins again, the, the, the first stirrings of medieval drama begin again in religious observances. They begin in the religious services of the Christian church in the celebration of the Easter or Pascha Mass. And it begins by there, there's a passage in the in the Easter Mass where you have, you know, the angel speak outside the tomb to the Marys when they come to anoint Jesus' body. They ask, you know, where, where is our Lord? And the angel says, He is not here, he's gone into Galilee, as he said, blah blah blah. Okay. It's called the Quim Quaertus trope, right? Where is he, essentially? Well, that essentially, that starts in the church just as responsive readings on, like on either side of the church, you have a, a member of the choir or chanters on this side, and they ask a question, and the chanter on the other side. Well, what is that really? It's dialogue, okay? That develops to where those two things get acted out. There's the beginning of drama, right? In the, in the Western world after the demise of drama during the Dark Ages, right? So the appeal to Dionysius and Crayon comes in. And the Course says, Crayon, line 174, the new man for the new day. That is, it, it's almost like the Course is saying the world starts anew. And Crayon is a new type of leader. He's a new kind of king with a new world that we are experiencing, whatever the gods are sending now. And that whatever the gods are sending now, is kind of like Crayon will be able to handle this. But whatever crap is, is, you know, is going to happen, you know, running joke, meme, et cetera, on Facebook is, it's 2020, what else can happen, you know? So Crayon is the new man for the rest of 2020, so to speak. So Crayon comes in, and Crayon gives us his opening speech, right? And a lot of what he says is good stuff. What do I mean by that? It's wise, it's, it's politically smart and astute. There's also a lot of dramatic irony. That is, he says things that he doesn't realize the full import of, but that his audience totally knows where it's going that, that is by the end of the play, for the simple reason they know the story. They know how the story essentially ends. Even though Sophocles, you know, he puts his own little twists and such. So here's what, here's what he says. I'll probably read this whole speech. Well, maybe not the whole speech, but quite a bit on page 67. Line 179. My countrymen, the ship of state is safe. The gods who rocked her, no, notice it's the gods' fault. The gods who rocked her after a long merciless pounding in the storm have righted her once more. Okay. The rocking and the long merciless pounding in the storm, that's just not the battle of Polynices and the seven against the Teocles. I, I think he's taking that back to the time of Oedipus. That, you know, from the time when Oedipus became king, the gods have been rocking thieves. So he says, out of the whole city, I've called you here alone. That is, you're the select, you're the elite. Way to kind of flatter the 
members of the chorus. Well, I know first your undeviating aspect for the throne and royal power of King Elias. That's Oedipus's father. That's why I said, you know, from the time of Elias's death to now, Thebes has been in turmoil, essentially. He says, I know that you respected Elias. Okay? You were loyal to Elias. Next, while Oedipus steered the land of Thebes, and even after he died, your loyalty was unshakable. You still stood by their children. That is, you stood by the children of Oedipus and Laius. Eteocles. Now then, since the two sons are dead, two blows of fate in the same day, cut down by each other's hands, blah, blah, blah. As I am next in kin to the dead, I'm their uncle, I now possess the throne and all its powers. Now, I don't know ancient Greek, but I would bet that the word get the get that gets translated possess cannot be translated occupy. And that's why Fagels chose the word possess. Because think of the difference if it were occupied or hold. I now possess the throne and all its powers means what? As opposed to I now hold the throne or I now occupy the throne. Think of it this way. Imagine a United States president who said, I possess the White House and all its powers. What would most Americans, left, right, in between, say? Uh, no. No, you don't. You occupy the White House, you live in the, uh, the White House, you are a resident of the White House. What's the difference? The White House has been called, from its founding almost, the People's House. It belongs to us. Okay? The throne and all its powers, do they belong to the king? Huh. So he goes on. Of course, you cannot know a man completely, his character, his principles, sense of judgment, not till he's shown his colors, ruling the people, making laws. True or false? Most Americans, let me rephrase, many Americans, we're in an election year. Many Americans, when they consider who to choose for president, who do we elect for president if they're going to vote, one of the data points that many Americans look at is, has this person held executive office, that is, run things, and if so, how did he or she do? Which is why, in our history of presidents up to today, um, the vast majority of them, have come from governorships. They've held executive office before. They've run states, right? Um, only a couple have not held any kind of political office, only a few, let me rephrase, have not held any kind of political office. Um, and of those, most, Trump's the only one who is, who, who is never held any kind of political office before, um, or run any kind of government organization. Let me put it that way. Um, Grant and Eisenhower hadn't held political office, but they were both generals of the military. You know, Eisenhower ran this little thing called the Allies in the Second World War. He was the supreme allied commander. That was both the European front and the Japanese, the, the Pacific front, front, okay? You know, Grant was the essentially the supreme commander of the Northern forces in the Civil War and such. Um, it, it usually, historically in the past, when you've had a senator run against 
somebody who had been a governor, majority of the times a governor wins. Why? Because the governor has had to make decisions that affect people's lives. Senators don't. Senators don't make decisions really at all. They, they, they talk. They vote to pass laws. That's not making a decision and acting on it. Right? So that's kind of what he's getting at. You can't know a man completely. His character, his principles, his sense of judgment until he's shown his colors. How does he show his colors? Ruling the people, making laws. Well, this isn't talking about our Senate. This is talking about handing down laws in a monarchical kind of fashion, in an autocratic fashion. What experience does Crayon have prior, prior to right now? None. None. He, he hasn't been executive. He, he hasn't made laws. So he says you can't know a man completely. He's kind of a blank slate to them. They don't know what he's going to be like. Well, what's the first thing he's done as king? This person will not receive a burial. He's issued a law, an edict, that, according to Antigone at least, and later on we're going to hear from Crayon's own son, according to his own son, Haman, goes against the gods, and Haman will add, all the people in Thebes disagree with it. Experience. There's the test. So it's a good test. As I see it, whoever assumes the task, the awesome task of setting the city's course and refuses to adopt the soundest policies, but fearing someone keeps his lips locked tight, he's utterly worthless. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about the politician who wets his finger, holds it up, and to see which way the political winds are blowing, who rules according to polls or focus groups. He's talking about the person who assumes the Austin task of ruling must adopt the soundest policies, even if the people disagree with them. So I rate him now, I always have. And whoever places a friend above the good of his own country, he is nothing. And the word friend there, the introduction mentioned, can also mean a relative, okay? So what does that mean? The person who places the well-being of a family member, the well-being of a friend, let's get all modern day political, the well-being of a donor, the well-being of a donor class, the well-being of a class of people who might cast votes for you, okay? Who puts that individual, that group, et cetera, above what is best for the state, he says, that person is nothing. I have no use for him. Okay, right or wrong? Is this good politics? That is, good use of power between and among people? Because that's what politics is. Politics is, is the appropriate use of power to rule, govern others. Ethics is interpersonal communications, how you interact with one another. And, and the play is also very much about both politics and ethics, okay? So he says, Zeus is my witness, and goes on. Top of page 68, line 207, I think. I could never stand by silent, watching destruction march against our city, putting safety to rout, nor could I ever make that man a friend of mine who menaces our country. So if, if somebody's going against our country, he cannot be a friend of mine. I will not stand by him. I'm always going to defend the country. Remember this, our country is our safety. Kind of a, you know, America first mentality. This is Thebes first. And, and in this time period, it was, it is categorically undeniable. Thebes against everybody else, if you're a Theban. Athens against everybody else, if you're an Athenian. Sparta against everybody else, if you're a Spartan. You only 
enter into trade, make any kind of agreements if it benefits you. It, it's never about, oh, what is best for those people over there? Uh-uh. It, it's all about me, my clan, my group, my tribe, my polis, my city state, right? So he goes on, line 215. So he talks about, you know, he's, you know these are his standards, etc. So he talks about the proclamation that he's issued. Hetaicles, full military honor, burial. Polynices, the one who attacked Thebes. Okay, he attacked Thebes. Why? Because he wanted to rule it. He wanted to take control of it. Now, Crayon says that makes him out to be a traitor. Well, a traitor only in the sense that he wants to replace the government with himself. Not a traitor in the sense that he wants to destroy Thebes or he wants to sell Thebes out to somebody else, which is what is usually meant by traitor. Okay, so he says he can't be buried. Nope, he must be left unburied, his corpse carrying for the birds, dogs to terror, etc. 232. These are my principles. Never at my hands will the traitor be honored above the patriot. Whoever proves his loyalty to the state, I'll prize that man in death as well as life. So you must be, above all else, loyal to the state. Now, look at the chorus's response. This is the leader of the chorus. If this is your pleasure, Crayon, treating our city's enemy and our friend this way, dot, dot, dot. In other words, there's a pause. Notice how that begins. It's a conditional clause. If this is your pleasure. It's like, well, if this is really what you want to do, Crayon. Pause. Power is yours. What's the next phrase? I suppose. What, is, what does I suppose mean? Well, it undercuts. It's a hedge. How is yours, I suppose, to enforce it with the laws, both for the dead and all of us, the living? Really? How does someone living enforce the laws for the dead? How do you, how do you rule for the dead? Grant, follow my orders. And they're like, whoa, not us, we're too old. No, no, I don't mean you personally, I mean, okay. So what do you want us to do? The leader asks. 245, see that you never side with those who break my orders. Put that positively, always obey me. Of course, you know, Crayon, or the leader says, only a fool could be in love with death because they realize Crayon's serious. If you go against him, he's gonna kill you. Death is the price, you're right, but all too often the mere hope of money has ruined many men. So he introduces an idea. And that idea is that people will do anything for money. People will sell out their state for money. I mean, Aldrich Ames, um, uh, Kevin, can't remember his last name, uh, spy for the FBI or CIA uh, in the last, Kevin Aldrich, I think his name was. Um, not Kevin Aldrich, Aldrich James, Kevin, can't remember his name, um, 20 or 30 years ago, sold out the United States to the Russians for a few hundred thousand dollars, okay? Um, the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg in the late 40s, early 50s, sold atomic secrets to Russia, okay? Um, that's what he's getting at. So the sentry comes in and the sentry kind of hems and haws. He kind of beats around the bush and says, wasn't me. Crayon's like, what was it? What are you talking about? What was it you? Uh, page 71, line 277 or so. Uh, the body, someone's just buried it, they then ran off. But 280, what? Crayon asks. And then look what he says. What man alive would dare? 
He doesn't say who would dare. He says what man alive would dare. Now he might just mean that. Surely there's no man who would dare to do this. So the sentry says what happened. And the leader asks at the end of the sentry speech, page 72 at the bottom. <coughs> Sorry, I've had a <coughs> sore throat developing, so I'm not sure how long this is going to last. The leader asks, line 316, could this possibly be the work of the gods? Could the gods be behind this burial? Now, why would the leader ask that question? What is the leader, what is implied in that question? If it were the work of the gods, then why would the gods be doing it? Because they think Polynices should be buried. And if the gods think Polynices should be buried, then what does that say about Crayon's decree? You might want to reconsider. Crayon, top of page 73. Stop. The gods? Line 319. You say, it's intolerable. You say the gods could have the slightest concern for that corpse? Wait, you mean the hero who came to burn their temples, to scorch their hallowed earth? You, you think the gods have come to bury and honor him who was denying them, was going to deny them their worship? 328. No. From the first, there were certain citizens who could hardly stand the spirit of my regime. What does this tell us about Crayon? Okay, from the first, me, how long is, has his regime been in power? Hours. So from the first, you know, Eteocles and Polynices' bodies are gradually cooling. Crayon claims authority. And he says, from that moment, there were certain citizens who could hardly stand the spirit of my regime, grumbling against me in the dark, heads together, tossing wildly, never keeping their necks beneath the yoke, loyally submitting to their king. He says, from the moment I took power, there were people plotting against me. Now, this is almost, you know, the definition of paranoia. These are the instigators. And that, what does he say? Somebody bribed them, my guard, to do their work. And he brings up the idea of money again. Money, nothing worse in our lives, like 335. Money, you demolish cities, you root men from their homes, you train and twist good minds and set them on to the most atrocious schemes. Now, Sophocles might partly be playing at here. The role of the sophists. Now, the, the sophists really come into their own more in the next century in the fourth century. But they've already begun doing some of their practices. So who were the sophists? The, the sophists were people who took money to be taught, excuse me, to teach others how to use rhetoric to their advantage in winning arguments. So what does that mean? They taught people how to argue all sides of an argument. But they required to be paid to do that. They were English teachers, essentially, composition teachers. Take a position and argue it. Now take the opposite position and argue it. Notice what that presupposes. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter if you have an internal moral compass that says, I can't take that that position because I disagree with it. According to the sophists, you can argue any position, essentially, as long as you're paid well enough. You're a modern day lawyer, to some extent, okay? So he says it all gets down to money. You pay somebody enough, they'll do 
what you want them to do. All right. So he turns on the sentry and says, it was you, you're the guilty one, et cetera, et cetera. Sentry says, it wasn't me. I'm just the one to bring, I'm just the bearer of bad news. All right. He and Crayon go back and forth. Crayon says, you did this for silver, line 366. Sentry says, oh, it's terrible when the one who does the judging judges things all wrong. Now, he's just a sentry. This guy isn't a philosopher. He's not an intellectual. He's a quote unquote grunt. And he's saying things are pretty bad. And the one who does the judging, that is the one who holds the power of life and death, judges everything wrongly. He kind of sees things clearly, right? So Crayon goes inside and the sentry swears, I'm not coming back. I'm never coming back here. Chorus gets its passage. So it talks about what it's heard and seen and it maybe foreshadows a little. And it talks about the glory of man. Numberless wonders, top of page 76. Terrible wonders walk the world, but none the match for man. Why? Well, look at what man does. That great wonder crossing the heaving gray sea. So man tames the ocean, so to speak. And the oldest of the gods, he wears away. Line 382, the earth, the immortal, the inexhaustible. How? because he tills the ground, he subdues the ground, and brings nourishment out of it. He controls the earth. What else? 391. He conquers all. How so? Training the stallion, the tireless mountain bull. 395. In speech and thought, all these he has taught himself. Okay, so conquers the sea, builds boats, learns how to travel across. He overcomes the earth, he dominates the earth, he controls the animals, and he develops and controls speech and thought, which control others. Line 401, ready, resource, resourceful man. Never without resources, never an impasse as he marches on the future. One thing stops him. Only death. From death alone he will find no rescue, but from desperate plagues he has plotted his escapes. He can, he can plot escapes from plagues, from some things. That's the thing he can't escape. Man the master, 406. Genius, pastoral measure, pastoral dreams, etc., etc. 409. When he weaves in the laws of the land, so those are the laws of the state, and the justice of the gods, he brings those two together and weaves them together, the warp and woof of a fabric that binds his odes together. That is, his odes have their authority, their power, because of the linking to the gods. He and his city rise high, but the city casts out the man who, dare, who weds himself to inhumanity thanks to reckless daring. Reckless there means thoughtless, considerate-lessness, who doesn't think about the implications and about the consequences. Okay? So when you weave together the laws of the land and the justice of the gods, the city rises, the city is built and is strengthened by that. But when he weds, him, he weds himself to humanity through reckless daring, to inhumanity. Why? Unthinking daring. See, thought, Sophocles is, is suggesting, is indigenous to humanity. So when you act without thought, you're acting inhuman. And if you're acting inhuman, then the city, look at the, look at the theater behind me, that civilization is no place for you. You wouldn't belong, you know, trying to point it, point it out here, you wouldn't belong here in the auditorium 
you belong somewhere back here on this rocky outcrop, all right? So Antigone comes in, accompanied by the sentry. And the chorus leader says, here's a dark sign from the gods. Dark sign. That means, what the hell does this mean? Explain this, gods. That's Antigone. Why are you bringing, did you break the king's laws? Yep, she's the one. Sentry says, caught her. Where's Crayon? Right? Crayon comes in. And the sentry says, nothing you can swear you'll never do. Second thoughts make liars of us all. There's nothing you can swear you'll never do. What do they mean by that? Situations might change. Remember what we were told very early on about bravado and Zeus? We were told, line 140, Zeus hates with a vengeance all bravado, the mighty boasts of men. Nothing you can swear you'll never do. Well, that's a mighty boast. What did, what did the sentry say? When he left last time, I'm not coming back. Well, here he's back. Second thoughts make liars of us all. Is that, a, is that being made a liar? I mean, a, a literal liar? So he says, I'm back, breaking my oath. Who cares? He's kind of going, well, gods don't care. So he says, here's the prisoner. Crayon, you took her doing what? Burying the man. What? Line 445. What? You're telling me the truth? Sentry, she's the one. With my own eyes, I saw her bury the body just what you've forbidden. There. Is that plain and clear? That's kind of like the sentry getting all sassy with him going, hello, do you hear me? What did you see? Did you catch her in the... Smack, smack, smack. So the sentry spells it out. And then says, line 484, she stood up to it all, denied nothing, I tell you. So Crayon, and notice we get, you know, the stage direction, wheeling on it. That is, <clears throat> he turns at her. You, with your eyes fixed on the ground, almost like she's being, you know, humble and demure, and abashed or ashamed. Do you deny you did this, yes or no? I did it, I don't deny a thing. But to the Furies, ask Orestes, did you kill your mother? Yep, I did it, don't deny it. So Crayon tells the sentry to get out. And then he asks her, my 495. Tell me briefly, no long speeches. Were you aware of decree of forbiddenness? Why does he ask her that? He told us in his opening speech, the whole city knows. Everybody knows of this decree. So why is he asking her? Were you aware? She says, of course it was. It was public. And, and you still broke the law. Of course I did. Now, I think he asked her the question, were you aware of the law? Because he's initially trying to find a way for her to get out of being punished for the simple reason that she's a member of his family. Okay. But she's pretty adamant. Yeah, I did it. Yeah, I knew it was against the law. Did it anyways. And then she says 499. I mean, she just throws this in his face. It wasn't Zeus, not in the least, who made this proclamation. Not to me. That means Zeus didn't tell me I couldn't do this. Nor did that justice, and notice justice there is capitalized, dwelling with the gods 
beneath the earth ordain such laws for men. Well, who are the gods dwelling beneath the earth? This isn't Zeus. It's not Hera. It's not Apollo. It's Hades and Persephone. Nor did that justice, dwelling with the gods beneath the earth, ordain such laws for men. The gods did not set out this law. Nor did I think your edict had such force that you, a mere mortal, could override the gods, the great unwritten, unshakable traditions. Notice, she's appealing to an unwritten law. Um, Jim Comey, former director of the FBI, wrote a book after he was fired. And the book, I think, was titled something like A Higher Authority. Well, that's what she's talking about. She's obeying a higher authority. Unshakable traditions. What does she mean by tradition? These are customs. These are mores handed down for generations that she's saying cannot be broken. They are alive, not just today or yesterday. Who's the they? It's not the gods. This is the laws, the traditions. They live forever from the first of time, and no one knows when they first saw the light. Well, they know when Crayon's Edict first saw the light, it was a couple hours ago. So she says, these laws, I was not about to break them, not out of fear of some man's wounded pride. Ouch, that hurts. Some man's, not even the king's, just some man, his what? His wounded pride. That's what you're acting out of, Crayon. And face the retribution of the gods. So she's saying, I can face the retribution of your wounded pride, or I could face the retribution of the gods. Hmm. Whose retribution would be worse? Die I must. I've known it all my life. Why? It's the one constant that everyone faces. How could I keep from knowing, even without your death sentence ringing in my ears, and if I am to die before my time, I consider that a gain. Now that introduces a philosophical conundrum. If I am to die before my time, what does before my time mean? That implies that her time is, is way off in the future. But if her time is somehow set like that, then philosophically, logically, she can't die before then. Okay? Hamlet has a speech where he says, if I die now, if it be now, it will not be later. If it be later, it will not be now. The readiness is all. That is, if I die now, then I won't die later. If I don't die now, then I will die later. The important thing, to be ready at every moment to die. So she says, who on earth, line three, or line 516, who on earth alive in the midst of so much grief as I, could fail to find his death a rich reward. Even St. Paul says, can't remember which letter, but even St. Paul says, to die is gain. Why? Be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also goes on and says, and if it's not now, it'll come later. So she says, so for me, at least, to meet this doom of yours is precious little pain. She's saying, you know, Crayon, my life isn't so great right now. If I die tomorrow, good. 
leader. Like father, like daughter, passionate, wild. She hasn't learned to bend before adversity. And there is a theme, not necessarily the theme, but there is a theme of the play. To learn to bend before adversity. You know, the Aesopian fables. He's got the fable of the mighty oak tree in the reed. What happens when the big storm comes? The mighty oak tree, which stands strong and firm, blows over. The reed blows and bends with the wind and then does what? It lives. Which is why Hamlet talks about to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. That is, to take the blows of life and go on. Okay. Crayon. No? Now, is he saying, no, she hasn't learned to bend before adversity, or is he saying, no, to everything Antigone has said? He says, no. Believe me, the stiffest stubborn wills fall the hardest. Well, that's responding to the chorus. She hasn't learned to bend before adversity. So he says, no, she's going to fall the hardest. The toughest iron tempered strong in the white hot fire, you'll see it crack and shatter first of all. It's also dramatic irony, though, because the audience is totally aware of what's going to happen by the end of the play. They know that Crayon, who has the stiffest, most stubborn will of all, He's going to lose the most. What's he going to lose? Daughter-in-law. Son. Son commits suicide. Wife. She commits suicide. Power. Loses the throne. Respect. Loses that. Self-respect. He loses that. He loses everything except his life. He has to live and suffer what he's done. So he goes on and says, 536, this girl was an old hand of insolence when she overrode the edict we made public. But once she had done it, the insolence twice over to glory in it. See, there's that idea of glory again laughing, mocking us to our face with what she'd done. It, it's almost like he's saying, if she admitted it and said, you know, I'm sorry, he'd have forgiven her. Not now. I am not the man. Not now. She is the man. If this victory goes to her and she goes free. <clears throat> What's he mean? She is challenging his male authority. She's challenging his patriarchal authority. He's saying, if I let her go free, she's castrated me. She's emasculated me. Everyone will say, <laughs> there's Creon. Antigone got the best of him. Never. Sister's child or closer in blood than all my family clustered at my altar worshiping guardian Zeus. That is, sister's child, that's what she is, is sister's child, where she were even closer in blood, that is, if she were my own child, and they were clustered around our family altar. She'll never escape. She and her blood sister are the most barbaric death. Oh, so, so now we get a little, you know, twist thrown in. They're not just going to die. You know, it's not just going to be a nice little lethal injection where they don't feel anything. No, now it's going to be a barbaric death. It's going to be torturous. This is telling us something about, you know, Crayon's mindset. He's vindictive. And this is also telling us that this isn't just about breaking the law. This is about 
personal vengeance on Crayon's part because they've affronted, as Antigone said, his pride. They wounded his pride, okay? So she asks him at the bottom of that page, line 555, what do you want? What more do you want than my arrest and execution? Crayon, nothing. Then I have it all. Nothing, you dead, that's it. Then why delay? 557. Your moralizing repels me. In other words, shut up and just do it. Every word you say, pray God, it always will. Line 560. Enough. Give me glory. What greater glory could I win than to give my own brother decent burial? That's my glory, she's saying, not her brother's. Why is she doing it? Is it all for her brother? Or is it to win some kind of personal glory? Keep in mind, what's your family history? You know, try to, try to think of an example of somebody in modern history. Um, we don't have any, but you know. Imagine you're Hitler's grandchild. Actually, I think Hitler does have a grandchild living. Maybe not. Imagine you're Hitler's grandchild. Uh, how do you live up to that? How do you ever get past that? Okay. Well, she's saying, maybe I can get some glory, some honor to my name by doing this. And she says, these citizens would all agree. And she points to the chorus. If their lips weren't locked. The only reason they're not publicly agreeing with me is because they're afraid of you and what you will do to them. Lucky tyrants, the perquisites of power. There's only one other couple that are a couple other actors, excuse me, characters we've heard of so far in the plays we've read that have been referred to as tyrants, Clytemestra and Aegisthus. Ruthless power to do and say whatever pleases them. Should I go there? Now with that, whatever one's politics are, right? In fact, I'll mention two presidents because it was said about both of them essentially. People say an awful lot today, some people say an awful lot today about you know <clears throat> Trump being authoritarian, Trump being a fascist, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what does that really mean? What would a real authoritarian or a real fascist do. People who called that person a fascist or authoritarian would be silenced. Silenced, like, like you know, in Soviet Russia, knock on the door, the KGB come get you and you disappear forever, okay? Some people said the same kind of stuff about Obama because Obama investigated, you know, reporters and such. Oh, it's this great threat to, you know, I don't know, the fourth, the Fourth Estate and the First Amendment, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but we didn't have reporters disappearing. We didn't have, you know, Tea Party leaders back in 2008, 2010 disappearing. We don't see Antifa leaders today. We don't see uh, BLM leaders today. We don't see, you know, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer being, you know, frog marched off in handcuffs. They're not tired. I mean, Trump isn't a tyrant, um, Obama wasn't a tyrant, et cetera, et cetera. Tyrants do what she's describing here. Tyrants do what Fidel Castro did, where people would be locked up, thrown in prison, forgotten forever. Tyrants do what Kim Jong-un uh, does. You know, when somebody publicly goes out against them, he puts them in front of a howitzer and shoots a 50 millimeter round through them. I mean, pretty bad stuff. Tyrants of what Putin is doing in Russia, you know, look at what happens to opposition leaders against Putin. They come down with these strange illnesses, okay? Crayon, you're the only one who thinks this. She goes, no, I'm not. They see it too, and they would admit it, but they're afraid. She says, and you're, you're not ashamed? Crayon, you're not ashamed to differ? Not ashamed for a moment, not to honor my brother, my own flesh and blood. So notice 
she uses rhetoric to appeal, you know, well, this is all for my brother. And yet at other times, it's kind of like the curtain gets pulled back a little bit. <clears throat> and she admits it's for personal glory. Okay. So, crayon. And I think maybe he's trying to appeal to, you know, her sense of fairness or honor or something here. Wasn't Ateocles a brother? What about Ateocles' honor? Polynices killed him. Antigone, you're right. He was a brother. Line 575. By the same mother, the same father. And I think there's a little... Pun may not be the right word. I think there's something there. Yep. Ateocles was a brother by the same mother. And then she says the same father. Well, bear in mind also, Oedipus was also a brother by the same mother. Then how can you render his enemy such honors? Antigone, he will never testify to that. Ateocles dead and buried. Ateocles won't, you know, rise up from the dead and say, you know, screw my dead brother Polynices, let him rot, etc. So they go back and forth, 584. Antigone says, death longed for the same rights for all. Death there means Hades, the, the god of the underworld, says, it doesn't matter who died. The same rites should be performed. See, in the, in the Trojan War, in the Iliad, when Achilles' best friend, Patroclus, some say lover, is killed by Hector, that's what brings Achilles out into the battle. And Achilles kills Hector, and then he ties his body to the back of, of his chariot, and he drags him around the battlefield. While the people what, witnessing this cry out in, in, in shame and agony and, and Priam begs Achilles to stop because he drags him around until the body starts to fall apart. And he finally stops and Priam sneaks out <clears throat> and comes to Achilles' camp by night in disguise. And he begs for Hector's body. And he talks about Hector the way Achilles talks about Patroclus. And he gets Achilles to see the pain. And he gets Achilles to release the pain, essentially. So they have a good cry session together. And Achilles releases the remains of Hector to Priam. And Hector is given proper burial. That's an example of Achilles showing proper respect for the dead, even after he's shown great and utter disrespect. I mean, part of the, the way Priam appeals to him is he will not have peace in death without this. Would you want Patroclus, your friend, not to have peace in death? And, you know, Achilles grants him the body and such. Crayon, never the same for the patriot and the traitor. Crayon says, no, he, he can never get the same. Once an enemy, top of page 86, never a friend. Notice that. Once an enemy, he could have been a friend for all of his life and become an enemy briefly. But then he's never a friend after that, not even after death. What, what he's saying there is there's no chance, no opportunity for redemption. There's no opportunity to turn things around. There's no second chance. Right? The crayon says, while I'm alive, 593 or so, 
no woman is going to lord it over me. So Ismene is brought in and Crayon says, you know, she was guilty too. And Ismene says, yes, uh, top of page 87. Antigone says, no, you weren't. You were unwilling. I never brought you in. You know, Ismene says, yeah, but I wanted to, blah, blah, blah. Line 610 and following. Antigone, who did the work? <clears throat> who did the burying? Let the dead and the God of death bear witness. Bear witness. That is, swear to it. Swear an oath. I have no love for a friend who loves in words alone. What does she mean? Who loves in words alone? Words without deeds. Words without actions. She's saying words without deeds, words without actions are meaningless. You know, we all, we hear things like that every day, all, all the time, you know, that actions speak louder than words, etc. I think that's partially what's involved when, when uh, St. James says in the book of James in the New Testament, you know, faith without works is dead. That, that, that means you can spout off all kind of faith stuff, but unless you're doing it, unless you're feeding the poor, you know, that kind of thing, it, it doesn't mean anything. If, if all it is is a, it's a simple word, you know, I believe, um, but you're not showing that belief, you know, although what Christ talks about in Matthew 25, the parable of the last judgment, then it's meaningless. That's why she says, I have no love for a friend who loves in words alone. Love is an action. It's not a feeling. It's, it's not a statement. It's an, it's an action. It is doing. Okay. Um, so as many tells, uh, Antigone says, tells her page 88, save yourself. I don't grudge you your survival. You chose to live like 626. I chose to die. And, you know, I told you what I was going to do. I knew the consequences. You chose to live. I chose the other decision. And then she says, 630, uh, 628, your wisdom appealed to one world, this world, the world of the living, the world of life, mine another, uh, the gods, death, Hades, or your wisdom appealed to one world, one set of laws, if you want, and mine appealed to another, another set of laws. This set of laws is the earthly, secular, and, and secular means of the time of this place, of this world, laws. And this is of the eternal, the sacred, if you want, the holy laws. Okay? They continue talking back and forth, and as many ask the question, and it's our first introduction to this to this idea and to this other character. Line 641 on page 89, talking to Crayon. You kill your own son's bride. It's the first we've heard that one, you know, she's engaged, and two, that Haman has a son. Absolutely. There are other fields for him to plow, you know. Lots of women in the world, okay? And then she asks him again, page 90, line 647 or so. You're, you're really gonna rob your son of that TV? Death will do it for me. Break their marriage off. It's like, yes, of course I am. Crown tells the guards, stop wasting time. Take them away, take them in. From now on, they'll act like women. Meaning what? And this, you know, I wish we were physically in class because, you know, this, this question always leads to all kinds of great, you know, conversation, especially from the women in class. How are women supposed to act? Well, in 21st century America, not quite the same as in 5th century BC Greece. They're not supposed to challenge men. They're supposed to be quiet. They're not supposed to have ideas. They're not supposed to express themselves. And we could go on and on. Okay. So the guards escort them out. 
and we have the chorus. Blessed, top of page 91, line 657 uh, or so. Blessed, they are the truly blessed who all their lives have never tasted devastation. For others, those who have tasted devastation, once the gods have rocked the house to its foundation, the ruin will never cease, cresting on and on from one generation on throughout the race. Kind of like Tantalus, Pelops, <laughs> Atreus, Thyestes, the house of Agamemnon, you know, Oedipus kills his father, marries his mother, as children by his mother brings the truth to light about himself, you know. And notice again, who's doing the rocking of the house? It's the gods. Now in, in Oedipus, the, the story is quite a bit different than in Antigone, that is the causes and such. <clears throat> because Oedipus, you know, he gets this prophecy that tells him, you are fated to do this thing. There's, there's no prophecy in this play, okay? So the chorus goes on. And now, line 666, and now as in ancient times, I see the sorrows of the house, the living heirs of the old ancestral kings piling on the sorrows of the dead in one generation cannot free the next. Some God will bring them crashing down the race finds no release. It's kind of like, you know, the, the line from uh, the humanities, the pain born in the race. And part of me thinks, well, most of me thinks, Sophocles is really talking here about the human race. The, those who are truly blessed, who all their lives have never tasted devastation, yeah, that's nobody. That's nobody. Everybody has some devastation in their lives. Somebody dies. Some horrible thing happens. Okay? And we can't find a release. And in the Greek system, there was no release. There, there, there was no quote-unquote savior. There was no deus ex machina. There was no God from the machine that was going to come down and solve the problems. Right? So they continue talking. The chorus does. Skip down to line 9, 90, uh, 695 and following. Page 92. He was a wise old man who coined the famous saying, quote, Sooner or later, foul is fair, fair is foul, to the man the gods will ruin. He goes his way for a moment only free of blaming ruin. He goes his way for a moment only free of blaming ruin. That is, he experiences a moment maybe of joy in life in this world. One of the best movies ever made, adaptation of a book. The book itself is horrible by William Goldman, Princess Bride, okay? Great line, famous line, short line from it. Uh, Prince Humperdinck, I think it is, tells Princess Buttercup, life is pain, highness. Or maybe it's, uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts, who says that. Life is pain, highness. Okay? Well, have, that idea really is at the heart of much of Greek tragedy. Life sucks, and then you die. And it's not much better then. <laughs> okay? So, Haman comes in. And Haman says, in response to his father, 
Father says, you've heard the verdict on your bride. You're not, you've not come here to try and change my life. He's like, no, I'm, I'm your son, you know. Nothing means more to me than you. And he says, that's a good answer. Good answer, son. Line 715. That's what a man prays for. To produce good sons, a household full of them, dutiful and attentive, so they can pay his enemy back with interest and match the respect the father shows his friend. Skip a few more lines. 723. Oh, Haman, never lose your sense of judgment over a woman. The warmth, the rush of pleasure, it all goes cold in your arms. I warn you, pause, big pause, a worthless woman in your house, a misery in your bed. Now, it seems to me this passage tells us quite a bit about crayon. I am not usually one to use this term at all, but he's, he's a bit of a misogynist. He, he doesn't like women. He doesn't care for women. He doesn't love women. He doesn't value women. Um, you know, women are only good for the rush of pleasure, but then it all goes cold, you know. He says, 729, let the girl go. Let her find a husband down among the dead. He talks about how she was caught in naked rebellion. He says, 733, I'm not to prove, I'm not about to prove myself a liar, not to my people. No, I'm going to kill her. Remember what the sentry said? I'm proving myself a liar. I said I wasn't going to come back and hear him back. Crayon has the same mentality. He said, I'm not going to be a liar. He thinks it would, he would make himself a liar if he were to now not kill her. Okay. He goes on, you know, show me the man who rules his household well, and I'll show you someone who can rule the state, blah, 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 blah. But whoever, 746, whoever steps out of line, violates the laws or presumes to hand out orders to his superiors, he'll win no praise from me. So someone who steps out of line and goes against order, someone who violates the laws, or someone who's, who speaks up to his superiors, who tries to tell his superiors what to do. He says that person will win no praise. That man, but that man, the city places in authority, that is the king, his orders must be, array, must be obeyed, large and small, and here's the kicker, right and wrong. Whether those orders are morally right or morally wrong, they must still be obeyed. Now in the Middle Ages, there is this, this political belief called the doctrine of I think it's passive obedience. And it was that, you know, Middle Ages, so Christian, you know, kind of belief system. It was that um, God allows certain people to become rulers. And those people have got to be obeyed, have got to be followed, because God has put those people in place as kind of correctors as disciplinarians for the people that is you know a king henry might be chosen by god as king as a punishment to the people so the king might do a lot of bad stuff but that's god's punishment on the people okay doctrine of passive obedience you have to go along with this okay He's kind of saying the exact same thing. Only it's not, you know, the Christian God is doing this. It's, you know, the powers that be, faith and such. Well, according to Crayon, what happens if you don't do that? If you don't follow the king, right or wrong? Anarchy. What does anarchy literally mean? It means against order. See, the, the arc there means higher, 
and it applies that there's higher order and higher order and higher order and, and everything is ordered everything has structure okay like architecture that's you know building according to an order a plan well anarchy is the the a or the a n at the beginning of that means not opposite against so against order against plan against structure so if you don't obey the king no matter what the king does all you're left with is anarchy show me a greater crime in all the earth therefore 756 we must defend the men who live by law never and here it is again never let some woman triumph over us you really wonder what a king crayon would have said about a queen elizabeth whether the first or the second i don't think he would have liked it and there was a a um, scottish presbyterian minister at the time of queen elizabeth who wrote a pamphlet against the monstrous regiment of women. His name was John Knox. He's one of the founders of the Scottish Presbyterian Church. Okay, Totally against women in authority. So, therefore we must defend the men who live by law and never let some woman triumph over us. Better to fall from power, if fall we must, at the hands of a man. Never be rated inferior to a woman. Never. It's pretty clear. I mean, a lot of Crayon's antagonism towards Antigone is misogynistic. Okay? So the leader says, huh, what she seemed to say makes make some sense. Haman then replies. And Haman's going to undercut nearly everything Crayon has just said. Father, only the gods endow a man with reason, the finest of all their gifts. So reason is the greatest faculty of, of man. And you know, if you make a slip in speech, he says, I haven't the skill, certainly no desire to tell you when, if ever, you make a slip in speech. No, someone else might have a good suggestion. And I think when he says to someone else, he probably glances over towards the chorus. Like, come on guys, help me out here. So he says, of course, you're the king. You've got big problems to deal with. It's not for you to kind of take the pulse of the people. It's not for you to go out and conduct focus groups and polls. He says, but I hear the word on the street. I hear what people say in the alleys and in the bars and in the restaurants. 775. It's for me to catch the murmurs in the dark, the way the city mourns for this young girl. And what do the people in the city say? No woman ever deserved death less. Death. She deserves a glowing crown of gold, Haman says. So they say, the rumor spreads. And then what does he do? He butters up dear old dad. So he starts with buttering up dear old dad. And then he says, but the word on the street is, and then he goes back to flattery. And then says, 788. Now don't please be quite so single-minded, self-involved, or assume the world is wrong and you are right. Single-minded means what? It, it, it means you have only one focus. It means you see only one thing. It means you block out everything else. Even everything else that might negate the one thing you see. Don't assume the world is wrong and you are right. Now, what does that really mean? Show some humility. Don't be so full of hubris to think that you're the only one in all of the world who is right. 
whoever thinks that he alone possesses intelligence, the gift of eloquence, he and no one else, and character, so intelligence, eloquence, probably there he means the gift of, of speech, of rhetoric, and character, good, you know, moral fiber, so to speak. Such men, I tell you, spread them open, you'll find them empty. That is, cut them open, there's nothing there. They don't have intelligence, they don't have eloquence, and they don't have good characters. They're full of hot air, is what he's saying. It's no disgrace, top of the next page, my 794. No, it's no disgrace for a man, even a wise man, to learn many things and not to be too rigid. To learn many things. To say, you know, I'm not only going to learn this one thing, or these two things, or these three things. I'm going to be a master of breadth. Right? And he uses the image of trees that we've already seen before. So, bend or break. But what did Crayon say earlier? The leader said, she's like a tree. And Crayon said, and that tree's going to fall. She's going to break. 804. Give way. Relax your anger. Change. Change. It would be best by far, I admit, if a man were born fallible, right by nature, excuse me, infallible, he says, yeah, that'd be great, man. If we could be born infallible, never be wrong. If not, okay, notice that's a big if. If a man could be born infallible, it's a condition contrary to fact. It's a conditional, it's a subjunctive. If not, if that's not the way things are, if the real fact is that we are born fallible, that we do make mistakes. So if not, and things don't often go that way, people born infallible, it's best to learn from those with good advice. In other words, listen to counselors. Listen to people who want what is best for you. Leader, you do well, my Lord, if you're speaking to the point to learn from him. That's the speaker essentially saying, huh, he makes a good point. Well, the speaker's last previous line was, in response to what Crayon said, huh, you seem to say what you say with sense. The, the leader is a yes man. Yes, sir, Crayon. Yes, sir, Amon. He's trying to straddle the fence. He, he's trying to appease both sides. Okay? Crayon says, so men our age, He's talking to the leader. Us old guys. We're to be schooled by a boy his age. He's 20. Us 58, 60 year olds. We're supposed to take the advice of a, a punk kid. Haman, only in what is right. That is, if what I'm speaking is right, is true, then yes. Cran, well, oh, really? Okay, so. Haman says, if I seem young, less to my years and more to what I do. Do is admiring rebels an achievement? That is, is admiring rebel, rebels an action? Is it doing something? Haman, come on, you know, I don't want you to admire treason. That's what you're, 820, page 97. The whole city of Thebes denies it to a man. What are they saying? Okay, so he says the whole city of Thebes denies it to a man. What does that mean? You're the only one who thinks she's guilty. You're the only one who thinks, take the back. You're the only one who thinks what she's done is worthy of death. That's why he said earlier about the comment 
assume the world is wrong and you are right. Okay. Cram. Oh, so Thebes is going to tell me how to rule? The city is going to tell me how to be king? Haman, now who's talking like a child? Come on, Dad. Am I to rule this land for others or myself? Interesting question. Gets kind of at the heart of both politics and ethics. Who does the king king for? Who does the king rule for? Um, is the king's responsibility to himself or to people that he's king over? Now that becomes a very important political question in the early and late Middle Ages. Uh, you know, one of the big questions about the old English poem Beowulf is, is Beowulf a good king when he becomes king? Because he goes off and fights the dragon and ends up dying because of it. You know, a lot of, of military political thinkers say it's the king's job to protect the people, but it's also the king's job to protect the king, to continue as the king. So some political theorists suggest that a good, ki good king doesn't himself go off into battle. He sends others off into battle. They are expendable. The king is not, essentially. Right? But, but he's asking, am I to rule this land for others or for my, am I to rule this land for me? You know, that's almost in essence the definition of a dictator. Haman, it's no city at all owned by one man alone. It's no polis, P-O-L-I-S, if there's only one person in it. See, the idea of the very idea of the polis is it's a group of people who do what? Who form a community, okay? And they work for the ultimate good of the community. And that good of the community is also good for each of them individually, okay? Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, about the... the heart of capitalism. He says the individual works for his own self-interest, but in working for his own self-interest, that is also the interest of the group that he is part of. So he works to build up capital for himself, and in doing that, that produces goods and services that do what? They benefit the people around him. They benefit because they are things that those other individuals want to purchase, want to use, that benefits him because it provides him with income slash capital, et cetera. He hires more individuals, builds up more business, provides more goods and services ad infinitum, okay? Cram, the city is the king's, line 825. That's the law. The city, what does it mean? It belongs to the king. What did he say earlier when, he, when his opening speech? I now possess the throne and the powers. They belong to me. Haman, what a splendid king you'd make of a desert island. You and you alone. But he wouldn't be a king, would he? He'd be alone. There, there'd be nothing and no one there. Okay? So Cran kind of appeals to the chorus. Haman says, page 98. Well, let me go back. Cran says, I believe this boy is fighting on the woman's side. I believe he's fighting on her side, the woman's side. Now look at Haman's response, 829. If you are a woman, yes, my concern is all for you. Wow. Crayon earlier said, if I let her go, 
She will be the man, not me. Now he said to Haman, I believe you're fighting on her side. Haman, if you're a woman, yes. Emasculation again. Which is why Crayon responds, you degenerate. What does degenerate mean? See, generate means to produce, to come from. Degenerate means to take away from. In other words, by calling Haman degenerate, he's saying, you don't really come from me. You, you, something else has happened to you. Haman, I see my father offending justice. Wrong. I see you wrong. You're, you're not just making a mistake. This is now headstrong, moral, willful choice. You are choosing wrongly. To protect my royal rights? Crayon asks. That's wrong? 854, Haman. Protect your rights? When you trample down the honors of the gods? Like, how dare you? Consider your rights in juxtaposition with the honors of the gods. Because what are human, you know, we bandied the phrase about so much today. What are human rights, you know, juxtaposed with the gods? There aren't any. There aren't any. There, there are absolutely none in that Greek system of thought. In fact, there aren't there aren't any until the age of enlightenment. Until David Hume and John Locke and those guys, and you know, a little bit later, you know, Thomas Jefferson, you know, Thomas Paine, writes a man and such, and until they create that language. I mean, even Magna Carta isn't necessarily talking about human rights per se. I mean, that, that notion of human rights is ultimately, it's an invention of the rationalistic age, the age of enlightenment and such, okay? You soul of corruption, and Haman's like, all right, that's it. 840, Crayon, every word you say is a blatant appeal for her. You're just trying to get her off. You're just trying to get her saved. Haman, because notice there's a long dash after Crayon speech. That's because Haman inter interrupts him. And you and me and the gods beneath the earth. That is, in its appeal for her and for you and for me and for the gods. Haman's essentially saying, I'm covering all the bases, Dad. I'm appealing for all of us. You will never marry her, not while she's alive. Haman, then she will die. Pause for dramatic effect. But her death will kill another. Foreshadowing. Okay? So, Crayon says you're going to suffer. And Haman says, if you weren't my father, I'd say you're insane. Crayon, you know, she's going to die. Bring her in here. I'm going to kill her in front of him. Haman says, nope, nope. She'll never die beside me. Don't delude yourself. And you will never see me. You'll never set eyes on my face again. And Haman rushes out. The leader says, you know, he's young. He's passionate. He might do something violent. Crayon, let him go ahead. He, you know. Leader, but are you really going to kill them both? Are you going to kill Antigone and his meanie? Crayon, no, no, no. The one who wasn't, no, I won't kill her. So, he is showing what? He can change a little bit. Okay? But what, what do you have in store for Antigone? How are you going to kill her? He says, here's what I'll do. I'll have her taken outside the city. We'll take her to a cave. We'll give her some rations, enough food to let her survive, you know, a few days. Let her pray to the gods. If the gods want her to let her live, he might reprieve her from death. Okay. Chorus sings about love. What does love do? It conquers all. It overcomes everything. 
It's never conquered in battle. It lays waste the rich. It stands the night watch, guarding a girl's soft cheek. It, you know, drives people mad. It, So Antigone is brought in. And Antigone goes on, um, and skip a bit. And she says at the end of her first speech, round line 908, page 102, I go to wed the Lord of the Dark Waters. And she talks back and forth with the chorus. And the chorus tells her, um, page 103. Line 943, you went too far, the last limits of daring, smashing against the high throne of justice. Your life's in ruins, child. I wonder, do you pay for your father's terrible ordeal? That's the, again, the idea we saw in the Oresteia, are the sins of the fathers kind of being visited upon subsequent generations. Are, are you paying for Oedipus's sins? And she's like, that's it. You've touched it. Breaking up the grief of father, you know. Right? Um, Crayon comes in. And Antigone gives a little speech. And Crayon says, you know, line 970, 969. Can't you see if a man could wail his own dirge before he dies, he'd never finish? In other words, can't you see that if you keep letting her speak, she'll never die? Just take her out. Just take her out. Abandon her there, 973. Alone and let her choose death or a buried life with a good roof or shelter. As for myself, my hands are clean. This young girl, dead or alive, she'll be stripped of her rights, her stranger's rights, here in the world above. Her stranger's rights, that's that law of hospitality that Xenia, you know, the wanderer's rights. She won't have any of those up here, okay? So, she, you know, Antigone talks about going to her tomb, her bridal bed, you know, to go down, page 105, line 984, um, that she will go down before my destined times run out. And there's that idea again, that she will die before her destined time. Well, it's a logical impossibility. If her time is destined, then it will, it will happen when it happens, period. So this play deals um, abstrusely, obliquely, tangentially with this idea of destiny and fate, all right? The next play, Oedipus the King, that becomes front and center. It, it's almost like, you know, um, Sophocles wants us to wrestle with the individual conscience versus the law of the state, following the gods versus, you know, following the secular authorities. And then the next play, it, it gets extrapolated to not individual conscience, but individual free will and freedom versus fate and destiny, okay? So she goes on and says lines 995 and following. Never, I tell you, if I had been the mother of children or if my husband or if my husband died, exposed and rotting, I'd never have taken this ordeal upon myself, never defied our people's will. What she means there is this, if I had had children and they had died, or if my husband had died and the, the corpse was rotting and exposed, I never would have done this for my own child or for my husband. And the, the introduction discusses this. And it's kind of like, what? This is weird. What do you mean? And so she says, what law you ask do I satisfy with what I say? Like, okay, so what, what am I getting? I, she says, a husband dead, I could have married somebody else. A child dead, I could have had more children to replace the dead child. Known people have done that. It's weird. Um, but mother and father both lost in the halls of death. No brother could ever spring to light again. 
I will never have another brother. I could always have another husband. I could always have another child. Well, until certain ages reached. Polynices will never recur. He will never come back. He will never be able to be buried again. She says, that's why I'm doing this. For this law alone, I held you first in honor. For this, Crayon, the king, judges me a criminal, guilty of dreadful outrage. My dear brother, and now he leads me off, a captain in his hand, with no part in the bridal song, the bridal bed, denied all joy of marriage, raising children, deserted so by loved ones, as many, struck by fate, I descend alive to the caverns of the dead. She's almost, it's almost like she's saying, I'm going to go down to Hades while still alive. And so she asked this question. What law of the mighty gods have I transgressed? She's, what she really means is, what have I done to deserve this? She, she's really asking, Where's the fairness, gods? Why, why is this happening to me? What, what have I done to merit this punishment? Why look to the heavens anymore, tormented as I am? And what she means by that is, why do I look to the gods for justice, the real justice, tormented as I am? Just think, my reverence, her reverence, her reverence for the unwritten laws, for the perennial traditions, she says, brands me for irreverence. Her reverence for the unwritten laws, you know, you could almost think of St. Paul's, you know, the law of God written on the human heart from Romans, to, or that reverence juxtaposed with irreverence of the state law. Very well. Very well. That's kind of like, so be it. If this is the pleasure of the gods, once I suffer, I will know that I was wrong. If this is the pleasure of the gods, as if, if this is what the gods desire, if this is the gods' will, she says, when I'm dead, I'll know. But if these men are wrong, notice these men, it's not just Crayon, it's Crayon in the chorus. Let them suffer nothing worse than they meet out to me, the masters of injustice. If I'm wrong, I'm gonna find out shortly. But if they're wrong, let them find out too. Okay? So they take her away. And Antigone says, as she's being taken away in line 1030, look on me, you noble sons of Thebes, the last of the great line of kings. Well, there's still as many, but you get the idea. I alone see what I suffer now at the hands of what breed of men, all for reverence, my reverence for the gods. I'm suffering this for my religious con conscience, she says. Okay. So the chorus goes on about women who have, you know, women and goddesses who have suffered for the gods and such. And Tiresias comes in. And um, Crayon asks, what is it, old Tiresias? What news now? And Tiresias says, I'll teach you, you obey. And Crayon's like, oh, I've never wavered from your advice. You've always been right. Crayon, I shudder to hear from you. So what does Tiresias tell him? I was trying to divine the future, offer sacrifices, and he says, bottom of page 111, line 1123. Public altars, sacred hearths are fouled, one and all by the birds, etc. And so the gods are deaf to our prayers. They spurn the offerings in our hands, the flame of holy flesh. He says, take all these things to heart, page 112. I warn you, 
all men make mistakes. It is only human. Once the wrong is done, a man can turn his back on folly. Misfortune too. You can turn away from foolishness, and what will that do? That will change your fortune if he tries to make amends, however low he's fallen, and stops his bull-necked ways. So, you're going in the wrong direction, you make a mistake, you can turn around. You can redeem yourself, you know? Stubbornness brands you for stupidity. Pride is a crime. Notice, stubbornness means you're stupid. Pride is a moral fault. Yield to the dead. Never stab the fighter when he's down. Where's the glory killing the dead twice over? What good does it do you to not let the dead be buried? How, how does that bring glory to you? I mean you well, I give you sound advice. It's best to learn from a good advisor when he speaks for your own good. And what does Crayon do? I even have him loosed on me, this fortune teller. And he goes on and starts talking about Crayon, uh, Tiresias as being a fortune teller who takes money for prophecies. And then he says, 1151, you'll never bury that body in the grave. Not even if Zeus's eagles rip the corpse and wing their rotten pickings off to the throne of God. Now, that's Cran saying, not even if Zeus himself came down here would that corpse be buried. Pride? Hubris, that, that's, you know, in the kind of Christian, that's satanic. How? He's placing himself above Zeus in doing that. He's saying, not even Zeus can pull this off. He says, we can't defile the gods. No mortal has that power. This, the gods don't give a rat. You know what about this? No, reverend old Tiresias, all men fall. It's only human. But the wisest fall obscenely when they glorify obscene advice with rhetoric, all for their own gain. Oh, here we go. Here we go. You're the wise old blind seer who's never been wrong. But you know what's really bad is when you go and you sell your advice for money. He's accusing him, accusing him of being a sophist, okay? Tiresias, oh please. Really? Is there a man who I actually believes? Skip Crayon's interruption. Who actually believes, line 1165, just how much a sense of judgment and wisdom is the greatest gift we have? He's saying, I'm so tired, gods, of talking to these dummies who don't realize how important wisdom and a sense of judgment is. Okay. Crayon says, you've got a twisted mind. Tiresias, you're the one who's sick. Crayon, I'm not going to trade insults with a seer. You already have. You've called my prophecies a lie. You and the whole grade of seers are mad for money. You, you, you guys say all these things and you just do it because somebody's paid you to. Okay? Tiresias, 1177. You're going to drive me to utter, to utter the dreadful secrets in my heart. In other words, you better be quiet or you're going to make me say something I wouldn't say. And he says, okay, here it is. Page 115. Know this too. So here's more prophecy. The chariot of the sun will not race through so many circuits more before you have surrendered one born of your own loins. That is, the day will not pass 
before one born of you will die. A corpse for corpse is given in return. Since you have thrust to the world below, a child sprung for the world above. Eye for an eye kind of a thing. Ruthlessly lodged a living soul within the grave. Then you've robbed the gods below the earth, keeping a dead body here in the bright air, unburied, unsung, unhallowed by the rays. So you've kept one above on the earth that should be buried. You've put one below in the earth that should be above the earth. So you're going to lose one of your own living, one of your own. <laughs> You have no business with the dead, nor do the gods above. This is violence you have forced upon the heavens. And so the Avengers, those are the Furies, the dark destroyers late but true to the mark, now lie in wait for you. The Furies sent by the gods and the god of death to strike you down with the pains that you perfected. The pains that you perfected. The opening of the play, Antigone talks about the pains that Zeus is perfecting for her. So he tells his servant boy, take me home, let him vent his rage on younger men, etc. Tiresias leaves, leader of the chorus. Wow, this is bad. These are terrible. He's never lied. Line 12, 17. What that means, he's never lied, means two things. He's never prophesied for, for, for money. Two, he's never been wrong. In all of Greek literature, Tiresias is always right. He shows up in a variety of things. We're going to see him in the Odyssey. We're going to see him in Oedipus the King. He's in, I think he's in uh, Oedipus and Colonus. It's been a long time since I read that. He shows up in other works. He's always right. Cram, I know, I'm shaken. 1218. It's a dreadful thing to yield, but resist now. Lay my pride bare to the blows of ruin. Good advice, you better do it. Tell me what to do, I'll obey. So he's going to change. He's going to let go of his pride. He's going to show that he's not stupid, stubborn. Then the leader gives him advice. Notice the advice and notice the order. Go. Free the girl from the rocky vault and raise a mound for the body you exposed. So what's he supposed to do first? Rescue Antigone, then bury Polynices. Why in that order? Polynices is going to stay dead no matter what he does. You don't know what's going to happen to Antigone. Right? So, Grant says, oh, it's hard. Giving up the heart's desire. What is this heart's desire then? To kill Antigone? That's sick. It's twisted. But I will do it. Right? He says, I will set her free myself. Right? Chorus comes in, praises the great god Dionysius, the god of the festival that they're celebrating, that the play is written to be performed in for, etc., etc. The god, the, the ruling god of Thebes, who god, guides and looks over Thebes. He's also the god of passion and riotous, you know, um, living and um, frenzy. Right? So the messenger comes in. And talks about crayon and such, and tells them Haman's dead, okay. that he tried to kill his father, missed, and then fell on his sword. And when he fell on his sword, he fell on his sword so that he died, but he had his arms wrapped around Antigone's body because Antigone had hung herself in the cave. So Antigone's dead by suicide. Haman's dead by suicide. And Eurydice comes in and she's kind of like, 
what's this I hear about my son? And the messenger tells her, your son is dead. All right. And the messenger says, so I escorted your Lord, line 13, 17 or so, page 121. I escorted your Lord. I guided him to the edge of the plain where the body lay. Polly nice is torn by the dogs. And he said a prayer to Hecate of the crossroads, Hecate, one of the goddesses of death, and Pluto too, Hades, to hold their anger, be kind, etc. And so he washed the body. And then they heard a voice crying far off, and they went to it, and that's where they found Haman still alive. Notice what he did. He didn't go to Antigone first. He buried Polynices' body first. In the meantime, Antigone kills herself. They go, or he talked, he relates to Eurydice now, that after they buried Polynices, did the rites for Polynices, they went to where they heard the shrieking. They saw Antigone hanging from, you know, something in the cave and the boy's arms flung around her waist, sees Cran, he goes at him with the sword, misses, you know, stabs himself and dies, you know, arms wrapped around and taking his body. 1372, the messenger kind of sums up his speech. Cran shows the world that of all the ills afflicting men, the worst is lack of judgment. Lack of judgment. Now, this is going to be an interesting theme for the next play. Okay? And Eurydice turns and re enters the palace. We're not told she runs. We're not told she shrieks or whatever. The leader's just like, huh, that's interesting. She went inside. Messenger. Maybe she doesn't want to mourn in public. Leader. Eh, not so sure. Somebody should go check on her, okay? Messenger exits. King comes back, Crayon, 1395. Look at us, the royal we, the killer, the killed. Excuse me, he's carrying Haman's body, it's not the royal we. Look at us, the killer, the killed. Father and son, the same blood, the misery. My plans, my mad fanatic heart, my son cut off so young, dead, lost to the world, not through your stupidity, that is not through Haman's, no, my own leader. Too late, too late, you see what justice means. Now, what does that imply? You took a life, a life was taken. That's it. This isn't the kind of justice we saw at the end of Aeschylus's play. Right? But bear in mind, this is not, this is set much earlier than Aeschylus's play, and it's not set in Athens. Right? So Crayon talks about, you know, he's learned, the great God came down and struck me, driving me down that wild savage path, etc., etc. And the messenger comes in and says, um, hold on, you got more pain coming. Line 1410, the queen is dead. Mother of this poor, poor boy, mother to the end, her wounds are fresh, crayon, no, no. Harbor of death, so choked, so hard to cleanse. Why me? Well, it's pretty clear why me. Why are you killing me? Herald of pain, more words, more grief. I died once, when Haman died, you kill me again and again. So they tell him, she heard about Haman, she went inside, she killed herself. Crayon, bottom of 126. And the guilt is all mine. Can never be fixed on another man. No escape for me. I killed you. I, God help me, I admit it all. And so he says to his men at arms, his attendants, take me away quickly out of sight. I don't even exist. I'm no one, nothing, leader, Good advice if there's any good in suffering. If there's any good in suffering. That is, if suffering has any meaning, right? 
grand praise. Come, let it come. That best of fates for me, that brings the final day, best fate of all. What is that final day? Language from um, the amenities, I think, the day of destiny, death. So he falls down on his knees and he says, take me now, kill me now, gods. Quickly, now, how quickly? So I never have to see another sunrise. The suffering is too great for me, he's saying. Leader, that will come when it comes. That's Hamlet's, if it be not now, it'll be later. If it be not later, it'll be now. The readiness is all. We must deal with all that lies before us. What's the all that lies before us? Everything from the very next breath we take to the very last breath we take. However much time that is. The future rests with the ones who tend the future. That's not us. It's not the gods either. It's the fates. Okay? Clotho, Atropo, and Lachesis. I don't remember. I don't have it written in this book. One of them weaves the thread of our lives. Um, I think that's Clotho. Lachesis measures the thread, and Atropo cuts it. That is when it's time for us to die. Cram. That, that prayer. I poured my heart in that prayer, man. I mean, <clears throat> he's essentially saying, <clears throat> how it's really serious and sincere in that prayer. Leaders, leader. No more prayers now. For mortal man, there is no escape from the doom we must endure. What's the leader saying? Don't bother praying to the gods. There is no escape. Or as Jean-Paul Sartre put it in his play, there is no exit. This is it. This is all there is. No one's going to come rescue from this situation. Cram, take me away, take me away. A rash, indiscriminate fool. Rash. He acted impetuously. He acted rashly and foolishly. Indiscriminate. We, our modern mind has told us that Discrimination is bad. <clears throat> well, yeah. If by discrimination you mean prejudice. But discrimination in and of itself is not bad. Discrimination means what? It means to be able to tell that this iPhone is not this bottle. I am discriminating the two between the two things. Okay? That's it. It's discernment. It's being able to tell what something is versus what it is not. Or to be able to tell, is this good or is this bad? He's saying, I was indiscriminate. I couldn't tell the difference. I murdered you, my son, against my will. You too, my wife. He says, where, where do I, whom do I look to? Where do I lean for support? Whatever I touch goes wrong. Once more, a crushing fate comes down upon my head. In the chorus, as in all Greek tragedies, gets the final word. It gets what's called the exodus. These are the words spoken as they kind of leave the stage. Wisdom is by far the greatest part of joy, and reverence towards the gods must be safeguarded. Bear in mind, in the Oresteia, what were we told wisdom is? It's what we learn from the experience of suffering. It's what we learn about life and about ourselves. And reverence toward the gods must be safeguarded. The mighty words of the proud are paid in full 
with mighty blows of fate. Remember, we're told at the opening of the play, Zeus doesn't like bravado or empty boasts. And so those who are full of bravado and empty boasts are gonna, what's gonna happen? They're gonna get taken down a notch. Or the way the psalmist put it, pride goeth before a fall. The mighty words of the proud are paid in full with mighty blows of fate. And at long last, those blows will teach us wisdom. Well, what's the wisdom? What's the wisdom they'll teach us? What do we learn from suffering? Well, one thing, at least, is humility. To be humble. To not think, as so much of our society does, that I am the center of the universe, that I am the most important thing, that if I don't get my way, then everything's wrong. That's one, one thing to learn. Another thing to learn is that I am not necessarily a victim of everything. My actions cause some of what happens to me. It's Crayon's actions that cause his downfall. It's taking responsibility for one's actions and one's words, okay? But I would say ultimately it's this, it's this idea of humility in the face of reality. You know, there's a, um, there's a book series and in the book series, this character learns what he says is real heroism. And he says real heroism, the real hero, is the person who does more for others than for himself. He says heroic action is doing more for others than for himself. Okay. We'll stop there and the next lecture will be over Oedipus the King. Don't know if it'll be as long. It might be actually longer um, and I'll try to get that one up in a couple hours. Well, maybe not in a couple hours, might be tomorrow.